Guys, we're in the middle of a pandemic and these are trying times. It's hard on our mental health, our mental state. And this is why I love our sponsor today, BetterHelp. They're the largest online counseling platform worldwide. They change the way people get help with facing life's challenges by providing convenient, discreet, affordable access to licensed therapists. BetterHelp makes professional counseling available anytime, anywhere, through a computer, tablet, or smartphone. It's brilliant. Sign up today. Go to betterhelp.com backslash solving healthcare and get 10% off sign up fees. COVID has affected us all, and with all the negativity surrounding it, it's often hard to find the positive. One of the blessings it has given us is the opportunity to build an avenue for creating change, starting right here in our community. Discussing topics that affect us most, such as racism in healthcare, maintaining a positive mindset, creating change, the importance of advocacy, and the many lessons we have all learned from COVID. If you or your organization are interested in speaking engagements, send a message to quadcast99 at gmail.com, reach out on Facebook at Quadcast, or online at drquadjo.ca. Welcome to Solving Healthcare. I'm Quadjo Caramante. I'm an ICU and palliative care physician here in Ottawa and the founder of Resource Optimization Network. We are on a mission to transform healthcare in Canada. I'm going to talk with physicians, nurses, administrators, patients, and their families because inefficiencies, overwork, and overcrowding affects us all. I believe it's time for a better healthcare system that's more cost effective, dignified, and just for everyone involved. Well, guys, Nation, we are back. And let me tell you, this last few weeks has been amazing to see the, the, the response from you guys. We really have been heavily encouraged by the response, whether it was uh, childhood vaccinations, recent update on that. It, like uh, People have been coming out in droves, listening to the show and subscribing to the show. And it means a lot. It means that we're on the right path. And I'm going to have ask you to continue to plug Quadcast Nation solving healthcare because I think it makes a difference. It uh, it was great hearing a lot of parents being appeased by our message and so forth. And so we're going to stick with the theme of COVID-19 and we're going to talk to Dr. Suman Chakrabarty about Omicron and, you know, what do we know at this time? This interview was t- took place December 4th and a lot of people, a lot of questions. Should we be scared? Should we be worried? Is there a need to do these travel bans? Will they be effective? All these questions that are, uh, a lot of people are, it's on front of mind, a lot of people, you know, and uh, we want to try and get ahead of it. We want to let, let you know what our thoughts are. So I think you'd really, you, you'll really enjoy this episode. I should mention Solvent Wellness, our community, online community to reduce burnout continues to grow, to continues to change that boogie. We're looking at almost 300 members, and we we got our online fitness classes, yoga, mindful meditation, cooking classes, fitness advice, productivity advice, uh, live Q and A's with myself and my wife, and we we we're doing our best to to reduce burnout amongst healthcare providers. Nine ninety nine for the year, nine dollars and ninety nine cents per month. If you want to go that way, first month is free. SolventWellness dot com, changing the boogie, yo. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to bring back my boy, Dr. Sumon Chakrabarty. Wildcast Nation, you know we had to bring him back. You know we had to bring back Sumon Chakrabarty, the man that needs no introduction, ID specialist, and we're back on, my friend, because there's a lot of hype, a lot of questions coming up with Omicron. First of all, what do you think of the name, by the way? What do you, how are you feeling about this? It, it's, it's pretty awesome. Look, <laughs> you, you and I are 80s babies. Uh, we played with Transformers. We remember Unicron, uh, Optimus Prime. And, and you know we all thought of that same thing. You know it. Oh, my God. Oh, you had to. Anyway, but, but back. thanks for coming back. Of course, man. Of course. I, can, can I once again say, that, do yeah. I still have the title of the most uh, visited person on oh, the podcast? Oh, for sure. For okay. sure. Yeah, yeah. My favorite podcast. You got, you got, oh, but man. That's so beautiful. You got, you got the throne, my friend. You got the throne. <laughs> Listen, like, I, I, honestly, I don't know where to start. Let's start with this. What are you seeing, hearing about, uh, about Omicron, the new variant? Because certainly what we're 
that's come what's come across in mainstream media is this we should be scared we should be closing borders we should be having those travel bans so let's just put it in perspective from your point of view what are you seeing yeah, you know, I think that uh, uh, what I'm seeing is a little bit of information that uh, some of it is uh, very concerning. Some of it is um, uh, reassuring, but it's just so little bits. It's like we don't, it's like having a couple of pieces of the puzzle. We don't have the whole puzzle yet, but we're getting there. We're, we're starting to, to, but you know, I think the thing that I have mentioned a couple of times that I've been worried about is not so much the virus as much as, as the response to the virus. Right. And, you know, many of us, uh, including you and me, you know, uh, other people that uh, are in our, um, in our circles speaking about this, I think when we saw COVID, uh, uh, Omicron, sorry, uh, a, a case in South Africa, we knew at that point, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's going to be cases everywhere. And then, you know, before there was any kind of uh, um, thought about this, talk about this, borders were shut, right? And I'm not a politician. I understand the impulse to want to do this. People are scared. You want to do something. But I think at this point in the pandemic, we have to realize that our actions have a lot of unintended consequences. It seems like on the surface, you're doing something. Uh, but, you know, I think in this situation, this can actually have a lot more harm than good. And look, it's kind of at this point um, absurd. There, there's cases everywhere all around the world, and we're just beginning to uncover it now. Yeah, I must say, like, as somebody who has got, you know, parents that grew up in a third world country and knowing that we are putting these, like, more of these economic uh, pressures on these countries yeah. that are that are struggling to me, uh, it doesn't feel right, especially as you said, this is this bad boy is everywhere, unfortunately. And uh, like to think that this is going to make a difference with the virus that we've seen spread. Like, I mean, we saw with the previous variants, like we know it's going to be everywhere and it's going to dominate. So I, I just think it's a bit on the ignorant side. But what what do we what do we see in like what's so I guess what is the fear? We'll put it this way: what is what is the fear that uh, that is that uh, a lot of uh, scientists and what what have you are or what are they worried about? I think the fear with the uh, uh, COVID, uh, especially look, we, this is two years of being in this. So uh, I understand that uh, when we hear about the variant, all of us got that that you know that kick in the in the in the stomach. Uh, that uh, this, this is awful. And I think the fear is that uh, it looks like um, it is displacing Delta in uh, Southern Africa, South Africa, particularly. And, you know, Delta itself was a beast. So if Omicron can do this, you know, that, that's scary. And, and, you know, for us, the, the, the problem has always been when you get a rapid case expansion, you get hospitalizations, when you get hospitalizations, then you lock down. And you know, we all know that lockdown affected all of us some people much more negatively than others, but none of us liked it, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're hearing on the, on, on the ground, the, the first thing was the, uh, all the mutations that they saw that um, much more than previous, which not necessarily a, uh, a bad thing in itself, but looks, there's a bunch of different ones that look for an increase in transmissibility, uh, some in immune evasion, which we've been worried about as well. And putting that all together, I think this is the picture for what we're initially seeing in the distance might be something very scary. So I do want to say I understand the fear. Uh, I don't want to uh, disparage anybody for having it. But the other thing I do want to kind of introduce here is we're a year and a half into this. And uh, I know that we still have to get vaccines to other parts of the world, especially Africa, parts of South America, right? Uh, but, you know, from our side of the world, just speaking where we are right now, it's not 2020. We have a population that's highly vaccinated. And what happens in South Africa is not necessarily what's going to happen here. And both areas we need to deal with accordingly uh, with uh, uh, public health uh, slash vaccination interventions. So you made some points that we got to reinforce. Um, it's a global pandemic. We need to be vaccinating the world if we're going to take this variant thing seriously, right? Second, when you're looking at the, the the dynamics, like when you look at transmission and so forth, we're looking at a land that is 25% vaccinated, specifically in South Africa. Doesn't doesn't mean it's going to look the same in in North America where we got such high vaccination rates. Um, put it this way, Suman, are we seeing any concrete data from what you've heard that it's uh, that people are getting sicker uh, or people, is it escaping vaccine? Like, are we seeing any even anecdotes or solid data to support any of this? 
I think for solid data, no, it's too early, but I think, yeah, it, it's things are starting to come in. So first of all, I will say that, uh, look, it, it, when you look at uh, Tishwan, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, but Tishwan in that area in uh, South Africa, um, you know, th- that, uh, that region, there's like a really, really quick expansion of hospitalizations. We have a little bit of preliminary data showing that actually the, the number of people who are hospitalized, uh, there's a significant proportion of them in that particular analysis that were actually incidental COVID diagnoses. They had something else, COVID was found on testing. Uh, there's also, they mentioned a little bit of increased number of people who are not on oxygen. So they, they were saying, this is a small data set, but we're seeing that, uh, fewer people on oxygen. There's also been the report of, uh, I think her name is Dr. Kutsi, uh, and a couple of other uh, clinic doctors who would say, hey, look, we're seeing this, it seems mild. As awesome as that would be, I think you have to be careful about that, right? We wanna make sure that we get some broad data and watch also from data coming out of hospitals and the ICUs, because we do also know that mild cases can start, but then these hospital things can lag behind. So I, like I said, today's what, December the, the 4th, we have to timestamp this conversation. Yeah. So I'm hearing the, the anecdotes that I'm hearing right now is that there are hospitalizations, rapid expansion, but the, it seems that the overall feel is that it's more mild. Wouldn't that be amazing if it were um, a, a lot more mild than Delta? Uh, so that's the one thing I'll mention. We have to wait to get more data and I don't want to come to any conclusions. The other interesting thing that I was looking at, uh, now I'm not an epidemiologist, but you know, I'm, uh, you and I both look at this kind of data all the time. There's an interesting thing that's coming out with the numbers that are being accrued that it looks like this virus might actually be a bit less transmissible intrinsically than Delta was, but it has a much higher ability to reinfect people. Okay, so when you put those two things together, even with the less transmissibility, it ends up being a net uh, more cases, the more expansion it can do. But the thing that I want to point out, and this is one bit of silver lining that I'm potentially seeing, is that we know in general, um, not always, but in general, reinfections tend to be more mild. Okay, so if we're getting a huge number of reinfections and they tend to be more mild, this might actually be a very big positive. Okay. That said, of course, you know, we're seeing outbreaks in places. We, we can see the potential of um, um, hospitals uh, being um, uh, overstretched, just like we saw in the first, second, and third waves here in Ontario. We just need to get more data. But I th- want to just mention one thing. There are concerning aspects, but there are also some potential positive aspects. Let's see. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it, 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 that's a good way to frame it. Like, you know, what is concerning and what is signs that are that are essentially positive and um you know i think that latter point about you know the affecting do affecting more or being transmissible more and uh those that have been infected before i you know like we always have that that theory that as viruses mutate respiratory viruses mutate that they become more contagious but less virulent less deadly and like, as you said, like, that's the best case scenario that we could ask for, really. Um, so, I mean, obviously, fingers crossed that this is what we'll, we'll tend to see. My- hey, can I add one thing there, Quadro? Yeah, I will yeah. give a, a shout out to my virology friends. I think we know that it doesn't always work that way. You know, that mm. something can become more transmissible and more virulent with time, right? Mm. Uh, we're just talking about, in general, what you see when a pandemic virus at some point can potentially become a more mild endemic virus, which is, we don't know, but that might have been how previous coronaviruses um, hit. So either way, though, we, we need more data, and I think that's what we're getting. We'll know much more even in, in a week. Yeah, more data. From your perspective, like... You know, I, I, this might be a tough question. Like, there's a lot of restrictions coming through. There's a lot of change in policy. Like, if I'm not mistaken, I, I think I read something about even in our home province here in Ontario, if you get exposed, high exposure to a Omicron patient or, or person, that you'll have to isolate despite your vaccination status. Um, where do you where do you stand with with these kind of policies, like in big picture? Yeah, it's a difficult one. And one thing I do want to point out, it's really important to ask. Um, I know I know the policymakers have a lot of dis- difficult decisions to make that are based on you know science, uh, you know economics, all sorts of stuff. I get it, um, and and certainly that's not what I do. Uh, what I will say is that uh, you know if you look at it from the science aspect of things, is that you have this 
um, uh, Omicron variant that is displacing potentially Delta. And like I said before, Delta was a beast, right? Delta in itself was just like, you know, freight training through all the other variants. And now Omicron can potentially be freight training through Delta. So when you look at it from that point of view, what are we actually trying to do with travel bans? What are we trying to do with um, um, isolation of every single contact? It's, it's, it's like trying to stand in front of a, of a speeding train. It just, you're not going to be able to do it. And I don't buy this uh, point that we're we'll going to be able to slow it down. Uh, either. Uh, so I think that this is coming, right? Mm-hmm. And not all of the news is bad. This may potentially be less mild, but the point is this is coming. So I think, what can we do? What can we control? Well, here, if you haven't gotten vaccinated yet, get vaccinated. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, for for uh, um, more older individuals, people who are 60 years of age or older, um, you know, uh, immune compromising conditions, get your third shot. Right. These are things that we can control and have a big a bit, a big yield. Uh, but I think the idea of trying to keep this out of the country, I think, is, is uh, uh, futile because it's, it's, it's here. And all these things we're trying to do to, like, get every case, slow it down. It's, I don't think it's going to work if you really have something that is um, fit enough that is, is displacing the beast that is Delta. All, all good points, someone. I guess it ties into as well. Like I tweeted out yesterday. I was, uh, it was a long day. I was like uh, 48 hours on call. I was gassed and we were wifey and I were talking about some, like, you know, what's going on with COVID. And I said, I just tweeted out like serious question. What is our exit strategy? Cause uh, I apologize if, if I go off a little bit. Cause this is going to be happening for forevermore. Straight up. COVID ain't going on anywhere. Okay. There's going to be future variants to come. All right. So is our, our strategy, our framework that we're going to really restrict things until we know more or until we're absolutely certain, or are we going to have a little bit of faith in, in our, our vaccines, uh, uh, to be able to push forward, knowing that there's going to be more and more uh, level of immunity throughout uh, society. Because as you mentioned, these restrictions have, have, have impacts. And so if we don't have a, an end game or a strategy that is sustainable going forward, we'll keep falling into this trap. And I think I'll, I'll speak for a lot of people right now. This is what they're saying. They're like, this is endless. We can't keep doing this. Like we got to have some kind of hope, plan, clear endpoint. So I know this is I'm, I'm edit, editorializing a bit there, but how do we? Like, wh- wh- how do we? How do we? What is the end game, Doctor Chakrabarty? This is uh, again. I think uh, another thing that I think is important is that having that off ramp, even if it's just one that you have a plan to show this way we, we want to do. I think that we are caught in certain things that have really gotten us into this loop. Uh, I don't want to discount the fact that um, this is a pandemic virus. Certainly, it impacted us in a very disruptive way all around the world. Right. And uh, it, it's, I'm not trying to say that it didn't exist. I'm not trying to do any of that. Clearly, it was a, uh, a, a big part of our lives. You know, now we have to keep in mind, we are in a very different spot. You know, maybe the, the, the vaccines uh, didn't completely stop this thing in its tracks. But what we're seeing still, even now, what are we now? Almost a year out of the first people getting vaccinated, that the protection against severe disease for the individual is still holding up very well. Right. So um, you mentioned this thing to me, uh, everyone. Uh, I finally met uh, a quadro in person about a month ago. And <laughs> that was uh, awesome. That was, it, was awesome. So good. It was, it, was, it was so good hugging you. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, and you said something to me that really rang true. You said to me, you were describing something, you were on call or something, and uh, you were sick f- with a fever and you were in bed for three days. And then you got a, you were, you were fine after that. That was 2000, whatever, 17 or 18. Yeah. I just realized, yeah. oh my God, that kind of stuff happened to us before and it wasn't really a thing, right? But with vaccination against COVID, if we're saying that we've been able to defang it and make it so that it's not severe, right? You've now gotten a situation where, yeah, if you get COVID, 
you might be in bed for a couple of days with a fever and you feel awful, your muscle aches, uh, joint aches, and then you're better. And that was what happened anyway, pre-pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that perspective is one of the big things that we have to kind of just start to move towards understanding. Um, The other thing is that um, understanding the goals of policies. I think that we can say that the the COVID zero, that um, ideal is not going to ever happen, right? And I think that things, all of these efforts to try to curb things and keep things down as much as we can in low risk settings, in the high risk setting, like a congregate living space, the hospital, that's very different. But in a low risk setting, you know, doing all this community contact tracing, uh, you know, I just don't see that it um, is going to be consistent with what our goals will be, which is trying to uh, mitigate harm which we can do very well with vaccines and also mitigate the harm of things like restrictions. And, you know, people were, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic when we were like, Oh, you just care about money. Not at all. Like I think that these things are inextricably linked together. And this, this lockdown really messed people up from all sorts of um, um, aspects. And the big thing is, is that we can't do that again. And I think that uh, the idea that if a respiratory virus goes up, that we lock down and we lock down society is not, is not something as a, as a first line tool that has been used in the past. So that's kind of all of that stuff. And, and, and the final thing I'll say is that I mean, even something as simple as the daily case count, I I put this tweet thread out, the daily case count, you can tell people's moods by how high the case counts are. And this dictates almost every, our discussions, it dictates how we feel, dictates how we're interpreting things. I really wish that our communications, we can't get rid of it, of course, right? But really stressing, look at the hospital, Quadro, you're in the ICU right now. You've seen the CCSO numbers this morning. Look at how low ICU ICU, um, occupancy is right now. Exactly. Hospitalizations are so low and yet people are afraid like they were a year ago. And a lot of that is a failure of messaging and that mindset change and perspective change is what we need to go forward but he, at some I, point. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I really, like I, I've been pushing it on some interviews lately. I even mid interview, I'd be like, yeah, we're talking case counts, but I, I'm going to push all of these media organizations. If you're going to say case counts, frame it with the hospitalizations. Cause look what's happening, man. This is the beauty of the vaccine. We're truly seeing that the the case counts are not as proportional as they used to be with hospitalizations because of the vaccines. Celebrate that shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's where we're at. Look at where we're at in terms of we're in December now. Right. And I don't not saying that hospitalizations won't rise. They will at some point. Right. But that's what happens um, in the wintertime when people get respiratory viruses like influenza. People get hospitalized. Right. But look, we're this deep into 2021 and we're still not feeling pressure on the, ho- the, the health care system. And I really think that needs to be kind of forefront. Mention the case count. That's fine. It looked, it's starting to look uh, steep, right? But then I think the first thing we should mention with, we should open with and close with the CCSO data showing the hospitalizations and how good of shape we are now compared to last year. Yeah, because, you know, and it's going to be like in terms of endgame at some point, and I don't know when the magic time is. This is when I need, you know, more expert opinion. But there's going to be a point where, you, you, we're not going, like, you're going to make focus your testing on people that are coming into hospital because once again, if it's endemic and you've got a runny nose, you're not getting a flu, a HSV swab. You're not getting a influenza swab. You're staying home. You know what I mean? Because you have that protection. You, you know, you, the, the virus ideally at this, that point would be defanged, truly defanged. But, you know, I, I'm not going to at all pretend to say, you know, pull out the crystal ball and say this will happen at X period of time, but that's where we got to move towards. And um, I think just a lot of people have been fearful since the conversation over the last two weeks has been on going backwards after all this uh, push to get not only vaccinated, but also boosted. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, And, and you know, I, I think that's also like you mentioned that policy of um, if you have a high risk contact with the suspicion of Omicron, that your vaccination status doesn't matter. Right. And that kind of stuff, I think, really um, erodes and already erodes the trust that people have in, in the um, the public health approach. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like I think that uh, uh, another thing I'll say and, you know, I've talked about this a little bit is that I'm starting to feel that, you know, as a physician, 
um, that, yeah, like, look, I can talk to you about um, the, the clinical aspects of COVID that I've, I've seen, you know, hundreds of patients uh, in person in front of me since the beginning of the uh, pandemic. So, uh, but we're starting to get into zones where I think physicians don't have that expertise. The idea of the policymaking, the economic effects, um, you know, the, the social um, uh, fallout that's going to be happening over the next, uh, you know, two to five years. I really think that as a, as a, a physician, I think I certainly have something important to bring to the table, but I think that we should be bringing in other voices of people of non-medical um, backgrounds to really help us through this, uh, you know, the next uh, several months, because they're going to be a huge part of the approach, the recovery plan. And as physicians, we don't have that expertise. And, you know, I'm really starting to um, uh, realize how, you know, I, I know my role is important, but how important, so much important um, uh, other roles outside of medicine have uh, going forward. It's a good point. And I, and I won't lie to you. I've been, I've been a victim of this too, talking about, uh, you know, my opinions on the mental health epidemic post, uh, you know, how some of these policies that we've been making, how I forecast the future and, yeah, that's fair. It's not necess- it's not necessarily at all in our wheelhouse. I, I I think what it comes down to is a lot of people just doing their best to to adv- do their advocacy. But I would I would love from a mainstream media perspective people that are have that level of expertise, sociologists, uh, political scientists, whoever it might be, econo- like uh, ec- economists, to to pipe in and say where we are moving towards. And, and the one last thing too, Suman, I just, the other thing about not to be too repetitive, but with the exit strategy, I think it would help us in a way that we would be less reactive. Like if we did really have that kind of like framework of how we're approaching the pandemic moving forward, mm-hmm. there's such a this strong like reflex to, uh, to to do something and it's got to be flashy and it's got to show that we care and and often it's not necessarily the best data driven decision it's it could be political it could be showy and for that reason I would just love for us to be proactive in terms of this is a framework when cases go up we're going to look at hospitalizations if hospitalizations go up this is what the approach that we should be looking at as opposed to saying oh whoa we got a new variant we don't know much about all right, let's 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 do X Y Z that uh, uh, step backwards. Let's let's be strategic. Yeah, moving forward. Yeah, and you know the, the, another thing is that I mentioned this earlier in this uh, uh, conversation is, you know, um, March twenty twenty was a very different um, situation, right? And I think that at that time, you, you people could be uh, understood why. Look, we have this pathogen coming in. We saw what's happening in China. Oh wow, look what's happening in Italy right now. This is coming first. What are you going to do, right? And Italy, um, Italy locked down um, after China did, and, and and that's kind of what we did. I think the problem with this is that this now in introduced into the idea in a lot of the public that when cases go up, when you have a respiratory virus, it means you have to lock down. It means you have to restrict, right? And, you know, this is not what, um, you know, uh, public health, I mean, it's not that this this type of idea hasn't been used before, uh, but on such a broad scale, never, right? But for now, I can see people when they're talking that, oh, the cases are going up, we're going to be in lockdown by, by, by uh, uh, the end of December. And to me, it's sad that that's the association that has been uh, made. And a lot of that's our fault with our messaging, right? And mm-hmm. I think um, you're right, st- strategic um uh, strategic uh, uh, approach is much better. And we have to also remember that many people did okay in the lockdown. If you could work from home, you know, if you had it, uh, you can still make income. A lot of people got decimated by it, mm. decimated by it. And, you know, uh, it, it's like, it just couldn't, you couldn't do it uh, again. It would just completely put them under. And, uh, you know, the people that didn't get hit hard by the lockdown should really, I think, take a step back and realize that this caused a lot of collateral damage that we were going to be dealing with for years to come. And um, in, in the healthcare system, that's where I can speak for the best, you know, people coming in um, late for, uh, you know, diabetic foot checks with rotting feet, uh, cancer diagnostics, heart attacks, uh, preventative stuff. Like so many kids have missed their vaccines. Uh, you, you know what I mean? So yeah. these kind of things are going to have a ripple effect and I really don't want to ever have to do this again. Yeah. And there's a I theme there. I mean, I, you know, I'm hundred percent with you, but just as a message to the public, just remember every action 
has its consequences, whether they're intended or not. And just to walk through that, to really think through that and say, you know, if we lock down, how is it affecting kids? How is it affecting uh, mental health? How is it affecting uh, uh, other diagnoses? Because I'll tell you, we're, we're going to be publishing a study, too, on non uh, COVID related illnesses during a pandemic. And you're going to see how mortality and, and, and other outcomes have been significantly worsened during this time period. Like everything, whether you, whatever policy, policy it is, travel bans, passports, mandates, whatever it is, it has a negative consequence. And we just need to be cognizant of it, walk through it. And sometimes, you, you know, maybe your hand is forced and you could do things to mitigate some of those risks. But it has to be part of the conversation. It has to be part of the uh, decision tree. Um, okay. Yeah, I can't agree with more, my friend, Sumar Chakrabarty. Listen, as always, my friend, you're killing it. Killing it. I, I love the messaging, out, uh, you know, it's on mainstream media. I love the connection. I got to tell you, people, we connect so much offline. Just to <laughs> kind of, you know, I've learned so much from him and our, our little uh, ID group. Uh, and uh, it, it's been a really um, a, a privilege to go through it with these guys, and uh, especially you, Suman. And uh, uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. And I hope uh, this is useful for so many people. Because I don't know about you, man, but my phone's been lighting up like crazy with Omicron questions. And okay. oh my goodness, it just, yeah, thank you, Transformers. Much. Let's end on a, on, a, on a good note. Yes, Transformers is a happy memory, and uh, you know, let, let's see. It's, it's, we got this. Uh, I think that uh, there still is light at the end of the tunnel. I think that uh, we're going to get there. So let's uh, let's uh, um, see what the data shows. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, my friend. Bye, man. Podcast Nation, we delivered. You asked and we delivered. Thanks for listening with uh, myself and Dr. Sumar Chakrabarty. If you want to leave any comments, go to quadcast99 at gmail.com. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook at Quadcast. Leave us that five-star rating, yo. Go to iTunes. Go to Spotify. Leave that five-star rating. It helps with the visibility of the show. It allows us to continue to train that boogie. You know what I mean? Don't forget about solving wellness. Healthcare providers. we we'll do some burnout. That's what we do. Solvingwellness.com. All right, guys, we're in the holiday season. Stay safe. Be with family. Be joyous. We love you. Thanks for listening.